a long-term foster care program for individuals with intellectual and developmental differences. This week on Mid-Ohio Valley Now. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Mid-Ohio Valley Now. I'm your host, Eric Little. Thanks for joining us once again this week, and thanks for making us once again a part of your weekend routine. This week on Mid-Ohio Valley Now, we're talking about a program that offers assistance for individuals across the lifespan. Mark Wilson and Regis Grote are here to talk about the Specialized Family Care Program. Mark and Regis, welcome to the program. Thanks for having Thank us. You. What is the Specialized Family Care Program, and who does it serve? Specialized Family Care Program is a foster care program for adults and children with special needs, intellectual and developmental disabilities. It also serves uh, at-risk adults and children who are in danger of -of out-of-state placement, institutionalization, group home placement, or who could otherwise be served in a more restrictive environment. And again, this is a program for adults as well. A lot of programs that involve the word foster care and the term foster care are aimed toward children and teenagers. This is throughout the lifespan. Throughout the lifespan. It is a forever home. You can start there when you're an infant and stay there until you're old and gray and passed away. It fills a service niche, I would imagine, as a result. Definitely. We often think about a program like this for children, but I always think people picture how the need exists for adults. Regis, we were talking about this earlier. There are a lot of natural families that serve as caregivers for a very long time. However, there comes a point to where they can no longer be those caregivers. So how many of your adults would have nowhere to go at a certain point of their lives if this didn't exist? Plenty of the adults currently in our program would not have an available option outside of our program. And whether they would have another option inside of our program that would be difficult. They would probably have to go to a two-person ISS group home to live just because it's easier for agencies to operate those, but it wouldn't be a family setting. And again, you talk about families. These are individuals sometimes that have been cared for for 50 and 60 years and their parents are not getting any younger. How important is it to think ahead and think of a program like this when you're getting to a certain point in your life as a caregiver? I am always trying to do out reach with natural families because I have met plenty of 80-year-old grandmothers taking care of their 60-year-old child and they have not made plans. They have worried their entire life and once they find out about our program and meet our families and meet the people who are going to care for her child, that makes their days much more happier. It's natural that you would have that kind of a concern, but are people surprised to learn that your program exists for that reason? Yes. Surprised and maybe a little bit relieved. Absolutely relieved. There are families who said, we should have done this years ago. That would have made mom's life so much easier. Just the peace of mind. Yes. And I have sadly been involved with cases where mom passed away and we were only notified after mom passed away and somebody had to take care of her child. And we would have loved the opportunity to have talked to mom to find out what their favorite foods are, what they did for fun what the medical issues were. We would have loved to have known that and we did not get that opportunity. And that's really why I want to meet with all the older folks out there who need to come up with a backup placement. Also, in some rural parts of West Virginia, especially, there's the attitude of we take care of our own. Right. And so this person is always want to be with us and we don't want any outside help. And, and they get to the point where they're no longer able. And then maybe the parents think, well, my son or daughter is going to take care of so-and-so. And they never agreed to it. And so they're stuck. And there's nobody there who's willing to do it. Yeah. And then you're at an impasse. Those and then an agency has to step in, and then they have to gather all this information they may not be have access to. Meanwhile, the individual that needs the care is kind of caught in the middle of this. And even when there are families who do want to take care of their own, they're unaware of what the resources are available to right. them. And there are some substantial resources that would make caring for that person so much easier for them. Regis, you've been in this field a long time. Taking care of your own now is a lot different than taking care of your own 25 30 years ago, there's a whole lot more things available for you. Is that maybe a thing you run into as well, where people just don't realize how much more is out there now than when they made that decision 25 or 30 years ago? Oh, absolutely. There's a whole lot more services out there, but many folks are still just unaware of them. It's sad. That's Mm -hmm. why we want to get the word out. People age out of other programs. Where do they go and what do they do? That's a good question. They may very well be sitting at home when they could have an array of services offered to them. How many people are you able to serve through this and in what areas? This is a statewide program. And back in our earlier days, there used to be over 400 specialized family care providers. Now we have less than 150. That's just how much of a crisis it is out there. And we are 
probably serving about 150 folks in our program right now. So again, the totality of the need and the number of foster families you have are not meshing. Absolutely. We could double and triple the number of families out there and there would still be a need that more folks would take advantage of. What happens when you're not able to meet those needs? We would tell them to go to their case management agency and explore the options. Yeah, I worked in IDD waiver program for 20 years. They would end up in what's called an intensively supervised setting, which is typically a one to three person home with 24 hour staffing. Some people require that level of supervision, but there's a lot of people in those settings who would be better off in a natural family home. Imagine being somebody who has staff rotate in and out three shifts a day, sometimes two shifts a day of 12 hour shifts, and those staff leave often and cycle in and out and quit and turn over a lot. And you're a person who needs a lot of personal care and somebody helping you toilet and shower and those people change a lot. It'd be a lot better served in a natural family home where your stability. It's a handful of people helping you in a delicate situation in life versus just whoever's on duty. That's exactly right. Sometimes people stick around for a year or two and you get attached to them and then they leave. Yeah. They become your family. And there's so many people I've served over the years who grew up in the regular foster care system and aged out and went into an ISS setting and don't have any family at all. And the staff become their family, but they change a lot. So um, it's a difficult situation. Or you could end up in a group home, a six to eight person group home where you have three staff on shift and seven other housemates and there's a more intensive setting and there's a lot of people with a lot of behavior issues and it's chaotic yeah. at times. A lot of people who don't necessarily have to be there end up being there waiting to be placed in a waiver home, a smaller setting. There's not anywhere else for them to go. Waiting for uh, the wait list to clear off on the waiver program so they can get a slot in a less restrictive environment and they may be better off served in a natural family type setting. So that's why we need more homes to place those people. I'm often trying to reach out to foster families because I believe that there are children in foster care who would meet the eligibility for our program. It's a much more substantial reimbursement for the foster family. It is a larger array of services for them. And then the best part of it, they could remain with that family forever. They're not going to age out of foster care. And you mean foster families, people that are already serving as foster families to be fosters for your program? Yes. And they could still remain with that agency that they're currently with, right. they would just also be one of our families taking care of one of our folks. Right. There's already individuals that have made a commitment to having people in their home on a regular basis and providing long-term care. So it's just another facet, another thing to open your heart. To find out more about the Specialized Family Care Program, visit the website at sfcp.cedwvu.org. Our conversation continues after this with Mark Wilson and Regis Grote of the Specialized Family Care Program. But first, this break. You're listening to Mid-Ohio Valley Now. Welcome back to Mid-Ohio Valley Now. Again, I'm your host, Eric Little. Let's read you in our conversation with Mark Wilson and Regis Grote of the Specialized Family Care Program. The website for more information, sfcp.cedwvu.org. What role do the both of you play within this program? Explain that for me. Well, we're family-based care specialists, so we oversee a certain number of homes, and we make sure that uh, the homes remain certified. We do monthly visits with them. We process the billing for personal care services. We do a well check each month of course each provider has to have at least 24 hours of continuing education each year we make sure they get that done just to make sure that all their needs are met sometimes we serve as a de facto case manager for them if they don't have a case management agency through the title 19 waiver program not everybody's on the waiver program so we do a lot of linkage and referral services for them make sure they have the, all their needs met and serve as an advocate we have to go to IEP meetings for the school for children sometimes and advocate for the child because we know how it is with the school system sometimes with not necessarily wanting to provide all the needs for the children. We do a lot of things like that. No two individuals of any ability have the same needs. So how much more effective is a program like the Specialized Family Care Program in serving the individuals you serve? We have a matching process for the families who are specialized family care providers and then for the people referred to our program. Each family has its own skills and its own talents. Some families are urban, some are rural, some have lots of family members, some have few, dogs, children, the whole thing. And then the individual who gets referred to us may have his own preferences, may have medical needs that need to be addressed, and lots of things like that where we have to meet the two together 
together to make for a well-matched family. Some families are very good at taking care of folks who are even bedbound, and they do very well at that. And there are families out there who take their person camping and fishing. And if I may plug this in, I have a person on my caseload. He shot and killed a deer for the first time two years ago. He did not get one last year, but I am so hoping he gets another one this year. So that individuals who do a whole lot of things, and that's someone who has to be placed in a family that allows them the opportunities to do those things. If he lived in an ISS or group home, I very much doubt that he would get the opportunity to go deer hunting. Lots of folks do not want to live with a dog in the home. Yeah. Lots of folks definitely want to have a dog in yeah. the home. Yeah, and again, it's just different preferences. How does someone or some family express interest in serving as a foster family for you? What are the, what's that step look like? Walk us through that. They can uh, go to our Facebook page. Just go on the Facebook and type in Specialized Family Care, and it'll pop right up. Or they can go to our website. You can find it on our Facebook page. Actually, that's the fastest way most people get to it. Specialized <laughs> Family Care on Facebook. Right. But there'll be links to it there, and you go to the link. It'll have a uh, thing you click to make a reference, a referral for somebody for services, and there's another link to become a provider. So you click on the link to become a provider. You have, I imagine I have to fill out some kind of an application. Then what happens? Once they contact us and we get some of their basic information together, we give them an application and a self-study. That This begins the process of their certification where they give us their name, rank, serial number, what their experience are, are working with folks, how they were raised, how they are raising their children, if they have any, what their discipline techniques are in their lives, if really is important to them. There's a whole bunch of questions that we want to know about them that helps with our matching process. And then once I receive an application, and I know the person is committed enough to complete the application, I will make an initial home visit to their home, talk to them about our program some more, and I will do a basic safety assessment of their home to see if their home is safe. Some of the basics are having battery-operated smoke detectors, having a fire extinguisher, just a series of things. I always tell people I don't want them doing anything special with their home the first time I come because I want to see how they live naturally. I'm not looking to see if they have dust under their water heater. They probably do, but I do not want them wasting their time cleaning their house from top to bottom. Right. You want to make sure if they've got a gun cabinet and if they have a swimming pool in the backyard and is it fenced in, basic things like that. Yes, indeed. After that, we start providing the training to them. Um, They work on completing their training. There is a bunch of information that we will need from them as well. We will need their first aid CPR cards, their driver's licenses, their car registration, car insurance, a whole bunch of things like that. And then we start a background check on them. We do state and federal fingerprints. We do a search of the protective services system within the state to see whether they have ever had abuse or neglect reported against them. And then they provide us with six names of family and friends and neighbors and all that to provide references that we contact those references some in writing, some by phone, some in person, to see what kind of qualities that they have. But there is a screening process our families go through. We can never be 100% sure, but that gets us closer to that. And that's a reason it needs to be thorough. Absolutely. I would not want to slack off in that one particular area. You're placing individuals in someone else's care. Yes, indeed. Most of our families, by and far, have a clear record. We have some family members who have a misdemeanor from a youthful indiscretion, sometimes a DUI, sometimes those things can be addressed and okayed. Well, those uh, are not disqualifying things necessarily. No, what would disqualify a person is a crime against another person. What is required of foster families? I know Mark mentioned the continuing education. What's that consist of? Oh, there's a whole battery of uh, educational pieces you have to complete. Some are mandatory, some are optional. You have to have your OSHA, you have to have your uh, HIPAA, you have to have your uh, you know, your bloodborne pathogens, you have to have your medication administration training, your ethics, lifting and transferring, showering, bathing, how to assist somebody in transferring if they need transferring from one place to another, basic personal care type stuff. And then if a specific 
person would come to their home that has unusual needs. I recently placed a diabetic with a family. That foster mom needed to know how the insulin and right. everything like that worked. So they would receive additional training like that. We talked about foster families and how they would be ideal for your program, but what does make a family ideal to foster for you? What kinds of things are you looking for out of the family? They have to be willing to provide that extraordinary care that a person with intellectual and developmental disabilities may need. Some of our folks need complete assistance, total care, taking a bath and getting dressed. Some of our folks need to be taught those skills and they need to be taught those skills slowly. So when somebody achieves manipulating a button and being able to unbutton as well, sometimes that's a big achievement. You have to be ready to provide that level of services. And then some of the folks who come to our program have been severely neglected or abused and they just do not have a whole lot of life experiences. They may have never fished. They may have never been to a church service and need to learn how to behave during a church service, a movie, eating out. Going to the mall. Going to the mall, absolutely. Going to the Uh, park. Having food on a regular basis. Some folks we get, that was not something that they had on a regular Hmm. basis. And they did not receive a loving family. So it sounds like a very simple thing to us to say you want to love and take care of that person. But when you find out what their actual skill level is, they may need to be taught how to be loved and how to be cared for. In a moment, we'll wrap things up with Mark Wilson and Regis Grote of the Specialized Family Care Program. But first, this break, you're listening to Mid-Ohio Valley Now. Welcome back to Mid-Ohio Valley Now. I'm your host, Eric Little. Let's wrap things up with Mark Wilson or Regis Grow to the Specialized Family Care Program. The website, sfcp.cedwvu.org. I would imagine people with young children probably are not ideal because they've already got a lot going on with their young children. This is a little bit more hands-on than they would want to deal with. No, that's a perfectly fine group of people okay. to be with. I so enjoy the natural family children in our program because they are often interact and play with that person because it's a new person. They may be of different chronological ages, but they are of the same mental age. They are so going to defend their brother when they go to school. There have been a few folks on my caseload where they have been suspended or got detention in school for beating up somebody who picked on their brother. Lots of times when they become older, I've had this happen when mom becomes older, they say, what's going to happen with my brother when mom can't do this anymore? Right. And I tell them you can apply and you can take over for your mom so that they still keep that person in their own family. Sometimes it's an asset and sometimes there are people who we would not want to place in a home who have children that are defenseless. Somebody who may have anger outbursts. Do you have to have past experience as a parent? Do you have to have children of your own, biological or adopted, to become a foster family in your program? No, actually the age to be a foster parent is 18. Don't even have to have children of your own. It sure is a nice skill to have but we have had people come to us who've never been parents before and they have learned. They usually have a desire to do this. Lots of our families will say, if you're only going to do this for the money, believe me, it is not worth it. But if you're doing this to take care of somebody, that's what's worth it. Do you have to have past experience in working or interacting with individuals with special needs to be a foster family? Not at all. We will provide training on things. We will answer their questions about that. But if they totally know nothing about intellect, intellectual or developmental disabilities, they can soon find out. The best way to find out more information, the Facebook page, Specialized Family Care. Yes, indeed. Regis, how has the family-based care industry grown and evolved and changed since you first became involved? That's a very good question. I thought of that the other day. In the early 80s, when we had the class action lawsuit, the Medley Decree, where we were taking children out of institutions, a lot of those children had peculiar behaviors or just a lack of behaviors. They were not toilet trained, just so many things. They had unusual behaviors. They would often play with strings, anything that they could find because they didn't have a lot of toys to play with. They didn't go outside a lot. And once we placed all of those children and we celebrated, then we were placing at-risk children, usually families where their child had been removed from their home due to abuse or neglect. And then we were seeing a lot of children who had had violence turned on them. And we had to be ready to deal with those behaviors, which were 
a bit more complex or just completely neglected. So there was a difference in what needs we had to go over. Mark, what do you hope to bring to this organization as someone that kind of comes in with some new perspectives? You have not been on the job here a long time. Well, I had experience with this program before as a case manager because I had clients who were in homes. Right, I've seen it from a different that. side, I guess. So I guess I'm seeing it from a little, bit, a little bit of a different side, right? I just hope to bring the resources that I've gathered over the years as a case manager and, and as a behavior specialist, too. I was a behavior specialist for several years and help parents in that way. A lot of linkage and referral and stuff that I can help out with. From networking and stuff over a couple decades, you know where to find stuff. And maybe you know how to get stuff from Medicaid and Medicare that families might not know how to get. And it's good to have that kind of knowledge because somebody's like on a waiver program, they have like a case manager. They cycle in and out real quick, too, because they move up or they move away or they get a right. job somewhere else and they might be on the job for a couple of years or something like that. And so that length of knowledge isn't always there. So it's good to have somebody around who, like Regis, who's been in this 27 years or so, or me, 20 years. And a lot of our people in this program as family-based care specialists have been around a while. And so it's good to have a, that knowledge base in this program to help our families. It's not just me. It's everybody working in this job has been around for a good while. The Facebook page is Specialized Family Care Program. And on the Facebook page, you can find the link to the website where you can refer someone to the program or you can apply to be a foster family for the program. I want to ask you both this before we go. What can participation as a foster family add to your life and add to your own family? My families will speak to me about that every now and then, about how it has changed their outlook on life. Some things are just not as important as they used to be, but people are more important. And then they are so proud of their children and their grandchildren who just accept people with intellectual and developmental disabilities as just regular people. And their whole outlook on life has changed as well, too. Our families take such great pride in taking care of somebody. I love taking before and after pictures. So if I can take a picture near that person's first day of placement, and then I will take pictures of them throughout the years. But you have somebody who is just a mess when they come to them, who is a neat and clean person, who is dressed sharply, who's eating a good diet, who's exercising. They're quite proud of that. Our families know that they are under scrutiny, that everybody watches them. They get quite a lot of home visits, and then the general public is just keeping an eye on them. What makes our program different from a staff setting is that when something happens in a staff setting, nobody knows who really did it. That has to be investigated. Whereas with one of our families, if it happened, it was the caregiver, and that's all there is to it. So they take great pride in taking care of people to avoid that, and I have to say, rarely, rarely is that something we need to address. I'd imagine another thing that's present in those after pictures that maybe wasn't there before a smile oh <laughs> yes indeed oh my gosh they are so happy some of the folks once they have lived with the family for a while they have just started using that family's last name as their last name and i had one lady on my caseload that when she was turning 18 and her final legal paperwork with the Department of Health and Human Resources was being done, she asked to legally change her name to the family's last mm -hmm. name. And her guardian ad litem was absolutely happy to be able to do that. And that says a lot about the care that they receive. And occasionally, a person in placement gets adopted, too. Absolutely. And Mark, from your perspective, what can being in a foster family and participating in that add to your life in your own family? Well, it's not just a foster family, but I think it benefits the whole community. It just makes you more well-rounded person. The whole family makes everyone more open-minded, makes you more a decent human being, basically. I, from my perspective, and my wife being in this field for 19 years, and our children being around it, and going to the ARC dances, and taking our kids and stuff, and, and all the other activities we go to, they love being around people with special needs. And my 12-year-old, he has uh, some disabilities of his own, but he takes to people like that, and they take to him, and he is like a, a champion of younger people like that with special needs and several of his friends he does sleepovers with have more severe needs than he does it's a great way to be it's a great way to look at people as your equals it normalizes that it normalizes that's the good word for it and, and that's the way it is for our foster families and then when they have kids and stuff too and not seeing any kind of differences in other people mark wilson and regis grote are with a specialized family care program thank you so much for sharing the vital information about your program today and for all your resources and your time and energy in this and good luck to you as you hope to attract more foster families to the program. And we will let you know if this radio show helped to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much.